Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. Every Monday, I drop these videos to keep you in the loop about all the happenings with SpaceX Starship development, as well as all the rocket launches we saw over the past seven days and all the other space news happenings that I found interesting. And we once again have a packed episode with Super Heavy Booster 11 one step closer to launch readiness, the unfortunate loss of a legendary Falcon 9 first stage, China's seventh crew rotation to their space station, Ariane 6's launch campaign begins, Artemis 5's SLS rocket begins manufacturing, and so much more. I hope you enjoy today's episode, and with that, let's begin with Starship updates. Booster 11 is the next in line Super Heavy for flight, planned to carry Ship 29 to orbit on what will hopefully be Starship's first fully successful mission. Here's a clip of its latest static fire test. We've been able to discuss Ship 29 and Ship 30 quite a bit in these videos because the High Bay and Mega Bay 2 are pretty viewable from the public roadway, but the same can't really be said for Mega Bay 1, which is where Super Heavies are processed, as it's now fairly well occluded by the huge Star Factory building, which, as an aside, didn't see any slowing in its construction over the last week. Workers are continuing to develop this building at SpaceX's characteristic massively rapid pace. But yes, an unfortunate downside to this building existing is, at least for us space nerds, it's harder for cameras to see inside Mega Bay 1. But we did see this, a complete hot stage ring has been taken into Mega Bay 1, almost certainly destined for the top of Booster 11, meaning that this booster is hopefully completely done now, and a good sign that SpaceX are still moving forward for Flight 4 to take place sometime in May. But on the subject of boosters yet to receive their hot staging ring, look no further than Booster 13, which departed the production site for the very first time last Thursday, heading off to SpaceX's Macy's testing site. Right now, this facility isn't able to support static fire testing, so our expectations were for Booster 13 to conduct cryogenic testing during its stay here, before presumed return to Mega Bay for engine fitouts and subsequent rollouts to the orbital launch mount for static fire testing. Lab Padre captured the test, and as you can see, albeit the visibility isn't the greatest, only the top of the booster saw frosting, indicating only the liquid methane tank was filled. And it was filled to max, indicated by the complete frosting of the booster's top half. This was done for the previous booster as well, and I guess I'm curious about why this is. Is it to both certify the upper tank and the structural rigidity of the supporting lower tank? Or any other theories? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And hey, if you're enjoying today's flight, be sure to leave a like, it really helps keep me above water in the eyes of the algorithm and all that. <laughs> So how's the future of the Starship program beyond Flight 4 looking? Well, for this year, SpaceX are hoping for the first attempt at catching Super Heavy in the jaws of the launch and catch tower for the first time. To enable this, the catch arms are going to need to be able to close much faster than they are currently able to. But over the past couple of weeks, we've seen engineers install upgraded actuators to the arms, increasing their performance. These were tested late in the week last week. Here's the results of that, courtesy of NASA Spaceflight. This might not be the absolute fastest they can move under their new power, and there's a good chance that SpaceX are going to incrementally test them with faster and faster closing speeds. I imagine this official SpaceX render of the jaws closing is the best approximation of how quickly they need to move, and to be honest, this latest test of the actuators doesn't appear that far off. Another big bit of news about what to expect in the immediate future of Starship development was this tweet from Elon Musk confirming that full and rapid reusability of booster and ship and orbital refilling of the ship are the two fundamental technologies SpaceX aimed to solve by the end of 2025, adding that these are the critical pieces necessary to make life multiplanetary. So how's that for a crazy timeline? Over the remainder of this year and next year, we will hopefully be seeing the successful recovery of a ship and Super Heavy and see the demonstration of orbital refueling. Of course, Elon time is a thing for a reason, and this seems like an extremely ambitious timeline, given that both Starship and Super Heavy are yet to successfully complete a flight without any issues. But obviously, we're not privy to the internal data and the minutia of design revisions that SpaceX engineers are, so who knows, why not be optimistic? As always, I have some SpaceX Starlink launches to discuss. Two, in fact. Let's just rattle these off now. The first took place last Tuesday. This was Starlink Group 6-53, carrying 23 Starlinks to orbit from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40. The first stage successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship after stage separation, completing its ninth overall launch and landing, 
nearly double digits for this one. <laughs> the second Starlink mission to discuss was late yesterday, so Sunday. This was Starlink Group 6-54, which again launched from Launch Complex 40 at the Cape, and again carrying 23 Starlinks to orbit. The Falcon first stage completed its 13th overall mission after coming down to a landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship shortly after stage separation. The third and final Falcon 9 launch to discuss also took place yesterday. The rocket carried two European Galileo satellites to medium Earth orbit. Galileo is a satellite navigation constellation and basically Europe's version of America's GPS and Russia's GLONASS systems, and this was the first time it's been launched by Falcon. The original plan was to launch on a Soyuz STB, but that was scrapped due to not wanting to work with Russia following the invasion of Ukraine, and Ariane 6 still isn't ready for flight. So Falcon it was, and the launch went well. Sadly though, this mission was somewhat bittersweet. You see, the payload mass required additional performance after the Falcon 9 first stage, such that SpaceX had to use all of the booster's fuel, including that reserved for boost back and landing burns. And so, we bid farewell and godspeed to Booster 1060. It was expended on this, its 20th and final orbital flight. The last time a Falcon 9 first stage was purposely expended was 146 flights ago, all the way back in November 2022. My favourite part of the launch stream was this guy, who I think mirrored all our feelings, giving a proud salute to the booster at the point of main engine cutoff and stage separation. While the booster had to be expended, the fairings of the rocket weren't, and recovery is expected by SpaceX's fairing recovery ship Bob. Not long after the launch stream, SpaceX tweeted that they're working on qualifying both Falcon 9's fairings and the boosters to support 40 missions each, with the work done to enhance Falcon 9's max flight count being in support of making strides towards improving the development of Starship, which would hopefully eventually leapfrog the performance of Falcon 9 by a very massive margin. <laughs> Eric Berger of Ars Technica made the humorous observation that it seems criminal that SpaceX aren't going to aim for 42 instead of 40. And if you don't get that reference, then you've got some Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to get reading. <laughs> Earlier, I mentioned that one of the reasons that Galileo launched on Falcon 9 was lack of readiness of Ariane 6, but this is quickly improving. Last week, ESA announced that as of the 24th of April, the central core and boosters of the first Ariane 6 are now on the launch pad at Europe's spaceport in Karoo, French Guiana, meaning that the Ariane 6 program is now entering its final stretch of development before the maiden flight, regaining Europe's ability to launch their own payloads to space without relying on non-European solutions. The maiden flight for Ariane 6 is currently expected to be late June, so mark your calendars. Now, this isn't really space flight related, but I feel like the crossover between space nerds and robot nerds is like, well, the Venn diagram would be a circle, right? <laughs> and both groups would be familiar with the incredible work of Boston Dynamics. They released a heartfelt goodbye video to the Atlas robot, including a montage of its sometimes painful development. The video ended with a heartfelt, until next time. And next time came one day later, with the reveal of the new generation of Atlas. And I think the top YouTube comment summarised this well. How do we ensure the public has a positive first impression of him? Well, make him stand up in the most disturbing way possible. And of course, the comments for how he literally seems to stand up like a Dark Souls boss. <laughs> All jokes aside, this is like an incredible leap forward from the now cumbersome looking design of the Atlas V1. I can't wait to see this thing in action. Rocket Lab conducted their 47th Electron launch last Tuesday on behalf of the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and NASA. Each agency had one satellite in the fairings each. Korea had the Neon Sat 1, an Earth observation satellite with a high resolution optical camera designed to monitor for natural disasters along the Korean peninsula by pairing its images with AI. For NASA, the rocket carried their advanced composite solar sail system satellite, a technology demonstration mission to test new materials and deployable structures for a solar sail system that uses sunlight as a source of propulsion, a bit like how a sailboat is powered by wind. The two satellites were deployed to different orbits, a feat made possible by Electron's kick stage, which can perform multiple engine burns in space to deploy individual satellites to unique orbits. The mission was a success, and both satellites are now operational. 
Now, last month, on the 21st of March, we saw the launch of SpaceX's crew resupply mission to the International Space Station, which saw the first ever Dragon 2 launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape, and the spacecraft delivered various experiments, crew supplies and hardware, totaling around 2,700 kilograms. Yesterday, the Dragon spacecraft autonomously undocked from the station's Zenith port and is now en route back to Earth. Once it makes successful splashdown, it will have completed four crew resupply missions in total. Remember all those upgraded RS-25 engine tests we've been seeing at NASA's Stennis Space Center? Well, these engines are set to enter service as the main engines for Artemis V. But right now, they're all that exist of Artemis V's SLS rocket. Until now, that is. Yep, gaze upon the first manufactured components of the Artemis V rocket at the Mishu facility. This large metal ring will serve as the aft ring for the rocket's liquid hydrogen tank. And that's all I have to say about that, really. But yeah, neat. <laughs> now, I feel like I should address something. Last week, I said there wouldn't be a space this week today because I'm away. Well, as you can see, I'm not. I uh, I got my dates confused. So it, it's actually it's actually next week that I'm out of office. So it's next week's episode that won't be made, not today's. Sorry, a, a bit awkward. I now have to find another bit of footage to stick on this bit. You guys liked the model trains I used last time, so I don't know how I'm going to top that. Hopefully whatever I put here was good. <laughs> China conducted their seventh crewed flight to the Tiangong Space Station last Thursday. A long March 2F carried the Shenzhou 18 spacecraft from the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center, carrying three Taikonauts to orbit. A few hours later, the spacecraft autonomously docked to the Nadir port of the Tianhe Core module, and so for now, there are six humans aboard China Station. The previous crew will be set to depart shortly. Laon Aerospace wasn't in action last week. Yep, unfortunately I had an unexpectedly very busy week and while I nearly got the KSP2 video ready on time, it just wasn't quite done and I didn't want to rush it out half-baked for Saturday. On screen is a preview of what's to come. We'll be visiting the fabled Duna Monument and make a trip to Ike as well. There are lots of twists, turns and disasters on this mission, so make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss it. While you wait for that one to come out, why not check out one of the two videos on screen? They've been picked for you by the algorithm, so they gotta be bangers. Also, big thanks to my Patreon supporters, names on the left there, who make all of this content possible. So many thanks for your continued support of my work. And that's it. That's the end of today's episode of Space This Week. I won't see you next Monday, but I'll see you uh, whenever I make another video, I guess. So Saturday for KSP2. <laughs>